Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final part of River City Girls. So, we have a new uh, Yakuza Hideout 2 raid, which uh, we're unfortunately kind of locked into this room until we finish it up. So, uh, in the meantime, I guess uh, you said you would. Adam, you said you didn't want to use Sabu and Ken immediately, but you clearly wanted to use like some kind of idea with them with uh, Sabuko and the Yakuza finale. How did that kind of come about? You know, and before I before I answer that, I just gotta say how weird it is just that dude sitting in the corner. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Looks like he's holding either a briefcase or a manila folder, but he's kind of just... Maybe this was his room? I don't know, but he's kind of just watching the action, not really doing anything. It's a, That's a weird NPC placement. You are m making a mess on my floor. Will you leave? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have, I have work to do. People, come on, kids. <laughs> oh, I saw, I saw just there. You were kind of struggling to get in position to grab the enemy. That is something that they definitely improved in the second game. But for some reason, in River City One, when the enemy is in giving up stance, um, you can't grab him from behind. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. That's <laughs> just one of those little minor things. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I mean. You know, you look at the old Kunio Kun games, and Sabu is at the heart of a lot of it. In fact, the very first game, um, it's kind of funny, the very first game is, is structurally very similar to this, in that it's like, rather than uh, saving the boyfriends, you're, you're continuously saving Hiroshi, who keeps getting beat up, and then Kuni has to save him. But you go from, like, fighting local Sukaban with Misuzu as the first boss, and then you fight... Uh, you know, some uh, biker gangs and street gangs, and you eventually go fight a bunch of Yakuza, uh, culminating with Sabu shooting you with the gun, um, as he tends to do in the series. So he's always kind of been there as a big bad. Um, so we knew that we wanted him, but uh, but yeah, just, I don't know. We, we could have brought him in here, but it just seemed interesting to um, kind of bring an original character, also because it's River City Girls, to end the game with fighting a female character rather than a male character. And then it was also kind of fun to have the misdirection where the entire time they're aware of it, plus the statues you're thinking at Sabu, until you see that uh, that intro with Sabako in a few minutes. So I have to wonder about this room. So I mentioned earlier on that I had practiced with older beat em up games. And uh, this reminds me very much of the last stage of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Hyperstone Heist, with the lasers coming in at regular intervals. Was that game part of an inspiration for this room, or was there something else for the Lasers of Doom? I don't remember how this one came about. This one, this one was probably something that Bannon came up with. Um, but, uh, you know, we definitely looked at a lot of the old classic brawlers. I think, you know, this is also the kind of gameplay you would see in a lot of the Double Dragon games too. The River City games tended to be more about, you know, just brawling with other students and just doing gauntlets of rooms of kids. Double Dragon had a lot more of like the spike pits and the conveyor belts and lasers and stuff like that. So I think, uh, I think it came from there, but again, it's just kind of like looking for opportunities to mix it up um, so that you're not purely just punching other characters for the entirety of the game. But like I mentioned, it's it's pretty limited in this one. We, we definitely got to play with that stuff a lot more in, in the second uh, game, River City Girls 2. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely noticing that as I play through it. Um, question. Ken. Ken is fake Kumi, Kunio, right? Yeah. From... Oh, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. So, um, Ken, he comes, he appears first and maybe only in the Kunio Tachinobanka, which we, we ported as River City Zero. Um, and uh, it, it basically, you know that he looks exactly like Kunio. And there's also a doppelganger of Ricky because on the back of his bike, there's a doppelganger as well who's involved in like the fake crime of that game. But it doesn't really explain how he looks identical to Kunio, where he comes from, other than he's Sabu's adoptive son. And so I think we actually <laughs> ended up fleshing it out a little bit more uh, in, in River City 2 than they did in the Super Famicom game, but that's kind of what we ran with. And and then, of course, it's funny in, in both uh, uh, you know the cutscenes of Zero and in 2 to play up the fact that since he does look like Kunio, Masako is immediately smitten with him and has to kind of fight her own impulses to be a, a, attracted to Ken. <laughs> you see, the, the funny thing is, when I got to the scene 
where that happens in in River City. I was playing as Cuneo and Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that was an Probably interesting some interesting line dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This guy. This guy is just okay. So the the thing you have to do to get into the final boss room is to get a bunch of explosive charges and plant them around this guy and then blow the door up. The guy is visibly standing there as the explosion goes off and yes. vanishes after the explosion. But he's still alive in River City 2 and his only excuse is that he runs fast. <laughs> that is true. I think technically, we'll see in a sec, but I think he has to technically be off screen or maybe it, maybe depending on whether you go left or right. But I think if you go right, he for the explosion, maybe he is on screen. Well, but... I, I looked ahead at, this, at the footage and we yeah. definitely go to the right side. So we're going to oh, see him okay. on screen. <laughs> okay, yeah, if you go left, it, it, so that's our fault. We probably should have masked it a little bit better or, or put him like maybe dead center on the door. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's a, a fast guy, apparently. It's just, it's just kind of funny. Like, maybe he's secretly got super speed, or maybe he's, he's just hopped up on turbo juice. I don't know. That, that's oh. a possibility, too. <laughs> yeah, speaking of juice, why the electrified floor? <laughs> uh, that's just another one. I, again, we were... We were so limited in our in our bandwidth to create anything other than the basic brawling. I think we just went with the the standards. So you know, having an electric floor, having a laser grid, having a, a spike pit, um, even the spike pit before Habari, we wanted that to actually, in the way that it looks, is we wanted it to be a conveyor belt, and it just was causing bugs and was just one thing too many. So it just it's kind of a platform in the end, but trying to work as many of those things in as possible and 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 again having very little bandwidth on this one compared to the second game where it kind of go all over the place with them i i have i have a question why did neither of you grab the lightsaber i mean come on it's the best weapon in the game it is the best yeah <laughs> it, it it sends enemies freaking flying and if you use it with the book that it renders its weapon type unbreakable um it it, it like completely snaps the game in two <laughs> <laughs> well we didn't have the book so but you know we we, we noticed that a lot um I, I noticed when we're watching twitch playthroughs a lot of people do not go for it when it's on top of you know a subway uh, uh um uh waiting area or on top of like a little shop i think it's because the shape of it is very inconspicuous and it kind of just gets blended into some of the backgrounds uh, yeah, I didn't even notice it until the last room by the final boss, but once I grabbed it, I was like, wow, this thing is amazing. <laughs> and, and I didn't notice it at all. <laughs> also, please, let me save Masako. Thank you. <laughs> is this going to... I, I was thinking, like, oh, is this going to be another situation where you just barely revive Masako and then immediately die yourself, <laughs> and then she revives you, and you both... <laughs> immediately have like two-thirds of your health bar back <laughs> i really like those tense moments because you'll see that a lot or we'll see that a lot when we're watching people play the game and i think in a way it, it really reinforces the friendship of these girls you know having i'm almost dead but hold on i'll get you now you got to get me and that kind of back and forth and you know that with their their dialogue with the the revival mechanic really kind of reinforces the friendship of them yeah, hold on, hold on, Kyoko. I'll just give you CPR with my boot. Yeah, and we actually we talked about a bunch of different ways with that. I remember originally, uh, I think we were thinking of like a mini game where you would kind of like go to like a first person view and be like slapping them back and forth to wake them up. And you know, ultimately we ended up going with the uh, the stomp, which worked really well. It's good to do on the fly, and it's also just using existing animations. Um, and then it uses the little ghost. The little ghost actually comes from Dodgeball, uh, which I think was the third game in the series. Uh, whenever you like really knocked people out, they would have a little ghost fly up. So that was kind of oh, an homage one to of that. Those, one of the sports spinoffs. Yep, yeah. Yep. Um, oh, speaking of, um, a few parts back, you mentioned a Double Dragon Kunio Kun um, uh, compilation. I did look that up between recording sessions. It's on PS4 and Switch, but unfortunately ah. not, not PC. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was looking it up too. It's got uh, eight, 18 games on it between the different localizations, which is pretty crazy. Oh yeah, yeah. It it has like newly localized versions of River City Ransom and stuff under their original titles, but it was all, also has the the uh, jank localized original versions too. Yep. I don't think anyone is clamoring to play Renegade again, but you know it's there if you want it. Yeah. 
So, since we're running low on rooms to explore, there's something I have wanted to ask uh, from near the beginning. During all of these encounters, I appreciate that you kept one particular feature. How much fun did you have having every single NPC shouting out a message at the bottom of the screen upon defeat? Oh, that was fun. Yeah, so that's, you know... <laughs> For people who have uh, aren't as familiar, that's a mainstay and, and featured very heavily in uh, River City Ransom, um, which was I think the sex no third no I think it, I think it goes what was Renegade I forget what it was and then I think it goes Dodgeball and then I think River City Ransom was the third game, um, but and everybody knows Barf is one of them. That <laughs> right there. Of, yeah, that was a lot of <laughs> nice fun time. and uh, and we escalated it too. So I think in the NES game, River City Ransom, there's only something like about five or so death lines that, that play. Um, ours is a uh, hundred lines and they're um, uh, split by uh, uh, the character's sex. And so um, a lot of them are kind of shared between uh, male and female characters, but then some of them, because they get a little character specific, are, are split between the two. But yeah, it's, it was fun. That was one of the things that we knew we had to put in from the very first mock-up image. We've got that kind of like letterbox dialogue style that was always something that we were going to put in. And it was fun coming up with all those things and just getting totally absurd with them, like having characters get insulted as they get beat up and stuff. Well, I didn't miss the part where occasionally someone you knock out will yell, my spleen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, when you have to, when you decide to, to come up with a hundred, you got to get pretty creative after a while. I think my favorite is, does anyone even read these? Oh yeah. I, yeah. I saw a few of those myself. <laughs> I want to remember is uh, one of the characters uh, or one of the lines is, whatever happened to civil discourse? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, it's like, at, at some point, yeah, you do it, You do start attacking the enemies a little faster than they have a chance to attack you. So, yeah, not entirely ironic when, when that line pops up. Uh, again, everyone has learned the art of puberty. Yes. Watch the exactly. first part if you never understood that reference. <laughs> Yeah, and it's such a fascinating, like, approach, even going back again to River City Ransom, because they're letterboxing the entire game just because it's so focused on those little call-outs and the dialogue when bosses show up and stuff. So even though there was no VO back then, it was always very... It's always been a very, like, story-driven kind of cinematic uh, approach to the, to the brawler genre compared to most. I was wondering about the letterboxing for a while, but then I realized, yeah, that's just a that's just an aspect of the way the series has looked for our, forever. Yeah, I mean, we could have made it unletterboxed if we wanted, just because, you know, with the the uh, River City Ransom and the older games, they're probably only drawing a lot of the levels as big as needed. We've got pretty massive levels, so we could have definitely taken that off. You're doing a lot of like vertical scrolling and, and horizontal scrolling in our games, but it was just, yep, matching that aesthetic of uh, the constant barf dialogue, the regular <laughs> passive VO, and then kind of just, you know, the way that the HUD is like in the little black bars at the top, it just, it, it felt right for the brand. Yeah, and I, I think it actually helps it, it it helps it helps it make it make it makes it easier to read the, the, the subtitles on the go. For sure. Um, oh yeah. I have a I have a lot of trouble in, in most games reading the subtitles for in game dialogue and I need to read the subtitles for in game dialogue because heaven knows it's not always gonna be quiet when that stuff starts happening. But uh, I sometimes like miss half of what's being said because like the subtitles aren't like outlined well enough and they blend in with the background colors yeah. and it just it gets a little annoying and they sometimes go very small on them i remember uh one the game that was really bad it was dead rising the, the zombie game uh i bought it before i bought my first hd tv and you cannot read it on a standard uh, tv yeah i remember when i was playing early xbox 360 games on a crt that was a yeah. nightmare is like every developer at the time wanted their text to be really small because yeah. they wanted to take advantage of that uh, uh, that resolution and you know even at that resolution it's not actually a good idea to have text that small but they were yeah. doing it yeah. exactly that's that's actually one of the few complaints i have about hyrule warriors definitive edition i feel like the text size got smaller when it got ported to the switch did it 
Hmm. Least, at least notice. it feels like it to me. Uh, maybe you can ask Ted about that to confirm later. I don't think I ever, like, oh. <laughs> and also that, that that's a completely false. Uh, urgency. So you hear the bleep and you guys are going in a different direction <laughs> and it creates that sense of like, oh crap, we gotta get out of there. It's totally just waiting until you hit a boundary on the left or right before it ex explodes. It, it'll, it'll beep forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very polite set of uh, explosive charges. Yeah, sometimes it's it's fun to play with, uh, oh yeah, and here's our our lead antagonist. It's fun to play with kind of the idea of urgency. I remember we did a Batman brawler years ago, and when you jump on a um, platform, it shakes like it's about to collapse, and then when you jump off, it barely collapses right after you get off. But it's kind of for show. You could actually stay on there for like five seconds before it actually collapses. <laughs> uh... I think I know the the game you're talking about. That's a that's a um, Brave and the Bolts game. Yep, yep. Yeah, we did yeah. the the DS one and the Wii one. That kind of, that kind of funny business really fits the tone of that particular show. Yeah, a lot of the, kind of the sensibilities of how we did storytelling in games like this and Ducktales and and you know a, a lot of our modern games kind of emanated from that from batman that was our first like super heavy vo game and it was just because that was the style of that show so we tried to kind of copy it but ever since then we've had a pretty healthy dose of, of voiceover in our games oh that's, that's a game that i haven't played extensively i think i have it somewhere actually but I, it's it, it's fun it's it's essentially rooted in double dragon 2 so if you play the kunio collection and, and try Double Dragon 1 and 2, and then try that, you'll see we're, like, totally ripping off most of the moves and stuff. <laughs> uh, now, Sabuko here. We don't have, like, any time at all to get to know her because she's a surprise boss at the end of the game, but yep. she does reappear in River City Girls 2, and I actually find her really interesting there because she seems genuinely less angry about losing this fight than she does about the way her family treats her after she loses this fight. And I just find that, like, kind of a really interesting character trait. Yeah, she's a very metered character, and, you know, especially compared to her father and her, her adopted brother, who's kind of a jackass. And I think, uh, you know, that was the thing that was the biggest appeal to me for the sequel, was I wanted that to be a revenge story about Sabako, essentially. Like, she's not the main character, but she's sort of at the heart of it, and... and the fact that, you know, things end poorly for her and her family here really sets up almost everything in the second game that the girls and Kunio and Ricky are dealing with for the entirety of it. And I think also, probably in, in due part to Xanthi Wynn's uh, performance as her, she just did such a fantastic job as Sabako. And, you know, you kind of get to know which characters, once you've recorded them, which ones are the funniest, which ones are the most interesting. And we just totally fell in love with her. So, it, you know, as we're developing the sequel, we that was just at the front of our mind is, oh, it'd be great to do more with her and bring her back and, and kind of, you know, show a little bit more from her perspective. Because like you mentioned, you get such a uh, small preview of her here. You only get to see her for about, you know, 30 seconds before and after the boss battle and that's it. Yeah, and it's and she makes an impression uh, during that time. To be fair, she has, she has, she manages to have the most serious personality out of all the characters in this game. But she still feels like she fits, and that's a hard balance to uh, to hit. I think the fact that she's that she's got enough of that she's got enough like spunk in her to still taunt you in the middle of battle like that, or to, you know, really rub it in your face when she manages to beat you, as we saw when Ryan and Jason wiped out on the first I mean, attempt. We had very little health there. <laughs> we were already low on health, so... Also that pose there. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the fact that she's di she does the whole thing where she sends her, her bad guys out to, uh, to fight you, which is meant to be a cheat, which is meant to, you know, piss off the player even more. But then she gets tired of them if you don't kill them fast enough and comes down and just kills everybody. And so, you know, really methodical, specific decisions in her personality and her flow, just trying to make her seem as, as tough and, and ruthless as possible. Oh, yeah. I, when I, w 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna admit I kind of broke this boss because the, the 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 mod set that I had installed when I fought her included a bring the weapon into the boss rooms uh, oh. function, and I had the lightsaber. It turns out the knockback works on the bosses. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. probably why we had that not working as such, yeah. Because I know at one point we did have that more open, and then so much of game development is like, well, I like this, but it's causing 30 bugs, and it's going to, like, you know, we can't finish the game on time if we have X, Y, or Z functional. Yeah, and... Well, as a result, I, it, the lightsaber not only knocks enemies back, like, to 200 feet, it also, like, the attacks come out really fast and have more range than your punches do, so it kind of made it way easier to hit the boss than it really should have been. Right. So, unfortunately, my fight with Sabuko ended pretty quickly. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because this this is a pretty like this is a pretty insane final boss battle. A lot is going on. She's got a lot of like elemental animal powers and stuff. And I'm like I want to go back and fight her legit because <laughs> holy crap. Yeah, and like uh, and then she also cheats um, because she's you know again really we wanted to just make the player just so angry at her there's a whole actually so people ask a lot what you know if we cut anything from the game we only cut one major thing from this game for time that we had animated and the whole idea was when she went from the third health thing right where she resuscitated herself to the fourth one initially it was gonna knock the players out and then you go into this fantasy sequence with Masako where it's like a field of flowers and she sees a younger version of herself and the younger version's like, come on, it's like very dreamy. And then you see her on the ground and you basically kick the crap out of yourself to revive yourself. And then you continue the fight. And it was just this weird little fantasy thing we had. And we ended up not doing it just because it was one more thing. We didn't have time to develop. But I think also in a retrospect, it probably would have been annoying as people play the boss and had to play her two or three times to beat her to keep going through that over and over um luckily though all of almost all of that got uh, uh recycled in the second game so i won't spoil how but we got the flowery fields there we got the young masaka with the bow and we got megan mcduffie did this incredible all vocal uh song for it as well so that's all somewhere in the sequel oh neat i'll be looking forward to that and yeah it probably would have broken the pace of the boss a bit yeah as someone that has worked on game development before at least on a game engine I commend you for keeping the bugs very minimal throughout. Yeah, ultimately that drives a lot of, of what you decide to keep and cut in the final stages of development. Yeah, and you know, more than one game, more than one otherwise amazing game has been ruined in oh, the second sure. half or at some point during the game because Impossible. there wasn't enough time and the choices made during development weren't optimal. Like, the entire second half of, of, of Xenogears. Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, I can, I can, I can see... I, I, I'm envisioning this moment in my head, and it does seem like an appealing idea on paper, but I am but I think it, it was probably for the best that it was moved to River City Girls 2. Yeah, I think if we could, if we had, if it had not been in a boss battle, if it had been something where you just encounter it along the way, kind of like we have the one-off uh, flashback of the girls meeting for the first time, I think that would have been fine. But yeah, mid-boss battle, it's just, it would have been too much. Would be a nice um, uh, use of the revival mechanic that could have happened in single player to yep, give yep. Hasabe and Mommy boss fight a little bit more context. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I probably wouldn't have understood what was going on with that. Oh, this is a classic River City Ransom yeah. moment, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, in fact, the way that he animates there, the fact that it's like almost two frame, like it's very kind of jaggy, the animation, we th that was a note. It's like, okay, don't make it too smooth. Like, make it look exactly like that towel animation from the very first game. <laughs> now, um, as I recall... Um, or at least I've heard this much. Um, 
The ending to the Hasabe and Mami boss fight was actually updated in a patch. Yeah. So it was interesting. So we, we, we always had kind of the idea of the alternate ending, but again, that was one more thing where we didn't have time to fully implement it. So in the original, original version of the game, before it was patched, you essentially... <laughs> <laughs> what? <I'm sorry. laughs> I couldn't figure out a transition. But from That's here on, it's my footage transition. and not Ryan's. So... <laughs> We are going to rewrite the stars, and... <laughs> but anyways... Like the um, real final boss of the game. That, that, that movie has a great soundtrack, by the way. Um, but yeah, so the very first version of the game was the, you know, the initial ending is, hey, the girls weren't really their girlfriends, and, uh, and, and you know, they punched them through the ceiling. And then when you beat the... Um, the Haspe and Mommy, you get kind of the same ending except you're punching them out. And and that was just again, it it, it wasn't satisfying and I was so happy that we were able to actually have the fully realized like secondary ending, which we'll see in a second, with the uh the the battle um in the patch. Because the whole idea was that it's like playing on the idea of like, hey, there's 50 games these guys have been with various girls in various timelines and various realities and stuff and who are they even dating and so I, I really like the idea that you beat the game it ends on kind of the quote-unquote bad note and then you uh, beat the uh, actual quote-unquote girlfriends up and then there's a, comp a completely different ending so I think the way that we finally got it with the patch is, is perfect because you, you get both versions of it if you stick through it to the, the secret ending and it was funny too because we have the secret ending so so, yeah, the way that you, you pull it off is you have to beat the game, and then you have to find all the Sabu statues, then you have to equip the two items, which we don't tell you what to do with them, we don't tell you where to use it, and I remember during development I still said, um, watch, someone will figure this out, we think it's so obscure, someone will figure this out less than 24 hours after the game is released, and sure enough, like, the first version of this went up on YouTube, like, less than a day after the game was released, because people are just <laughs> so quick and clever about that stuff. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. So, Hasabe and Mami. They are, I would say, actually, like, a little easier than Sabuko, uh, at least as far as avoiding her attacks goes. Uh, they might they might hit you harder. I'm not, I'm not actually sure about that, though, because I'm level 30, and basically none of the bosses on, 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 a, on a regular new game can really damage my health all that quickly right. anymore. Um, but I have the, I, I have the, uh, damage numbers on, so one of the things that you're going to see once or twice throughout this battle is that Hasabe and Mami have one, have one major Achilles heel, at least for the first three phases, and that's that there are two targets that share one health bar. If you manage to hit them both at the same time, you're basically doubling your damage. So, if you're daring enough to try it, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> That's interesting, and you know, I, I knew that, but I never thought of it in that context, because most people do not try to, like, group them together. Usually, you know, they kind of run after the one and they run after the other, especially, obviously, in multiplayer, but yeah, you, you really do get a twofer on that if you can keep them close together. One of, the, one of the quirks of the combat system when enemies are close together is that sometimes you only damage one of the enemies and the others just get knocked down by the impact but don't actually take health damage. So it can be a little, it can be a little challenging to figure out which attacks are good for trying to damage multiple enemies at once. But um, that's another thing that I think the damage numbers help for because they give you that immediate feedback. But basically, I, right, right now I was actually trying to see if I could grab them because it would have been really satisfying oh, yeah. to do a stone cold stunner on one of these guys, <laughs> on one of these two. <laughs> Unfortunately, not an option. And I love the uh, yeah the absurdity of these attacks, which which were <laughs> created by Dan and uh, my AD on this, and and then also K, you are our uh, lead animator. I love how crazy they are, and and also it sort of in a way reinforces it the idea that they're better than you because you know they they have such strong friendship they can do these crazy combo attacks and <laughs> Masako and Kyoko are more just kind of singularly clumsily bundling their way through the adventure so I like the guy the idea that even right to the end they're kind of rubbing your face in, in how superior they are it's similar to uh, the Simpsons arcade game where you can have two characters do uh, combo moves together 
Yep, I love that. One of the one of the things about um, Hasabe and Mami though is that they actually do have some moves that your characters share. Yep. That that punch combo that Hasabe does. It's, yep, and then it's, the drill <laughs> the drill kick that Mami does. They're essentially evil uh, versions of Masako and Kyoko. They they share very similar. Oof. Things. That's, that's a good one of the both of them. <laughs> that's one of those two first I was talking about. <laughs> Just double the damage on one of the, on one of your strongest attacks. Now this one threw me a, threw me for a loop though. Um, the the fourth phase of Hasabe and Mame. You, you you can fight Hasabe, and even with the damage numbers on it, looks like you're damaging her. But her health, but the health meter isn't 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 going anywhere. I was like, why? What's happening? And I was like, okay, okay, what's going on? And I was looking up at the, that angel, and I, was, I, was, I wasn't entirely awake while fighting this, so it took me a few seconds to catch on, because I've been playing in single player, so I'm not sure what that angel is. And then I'm ah. like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's the that revival mechanic. <laughs> so I just try to kick the thing just to see if it'll work, and sure enough, that's what damages the health bar. Yeah, and you can actually, technically it's both of them, but it's much more powerful to go after the angels. So you can hypothetically wear down the health bar just by attacking the remaining character, but it's it really is slow. Um, we do occasionally see that, though, so I'll sometimes see in playthroughs where somebody will whittle it down with the angel to where, you know, there's a sliver left, and then, you know, punch out, in this case, Hasabe for the, the final kill. It is possible. Oh, I didn't know that. Because the health bar doesn't visibly move, it, so... It, yeah, it's it, it's basically the final health bar has a ton of health to incentivize you to go after the angel, but it, it very, very slowly moves. Oh, okay. You see, I thought, like, Hasabe was just straight up inv invulnerable at this point, but no, it turns out she's just playing on Dante Must Die mode. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So now we get to, I guess, the confusing part with with the alternate ending, and then the original story. It's, I guess, what? Oh, right, and they're even talking about the the meta stuff here. It's like, who was really, who were really the quote unquote bad people in this case? Because it's, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say two words: Citizen Kane. What? Yeah. What? I mean, really, the girls, aside from being a little catty, Hasabe and Mommy don't really do anything wrong. And, and you know, if, if you believe the first reality where they are currently dating Ricky and Kunio, really, they're just kind of being snippy towards some, you know, girls that that have a crush on their boyfriend. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I really like playing with that kind of stuff. The same thing with, we have a game called Cat Girl Without Salad, um, and it's sort of the same thing. Like, if you really break down what her motivations are, it's kind of like, she seems a little more evil than the actual villains, and I, I think it's always fun to play with that stuff. Yeah, that's uh, interesting to think about. I mean, I was so fed up with how vile those two were being. That I didn't really think about it over too, uh, too much, but when I think about it, yeah, this is kind of this is kind of a dubious situation. Yeah, because if the, when you really think about it, they are being rude to them and they're insulting them, but at the same time, they're telling them where to go, they're giving them mission tips and stuff, and they're basically they're never seeking out uh, Masako and Kyoko. They always come to them. The girls are just uh, Hasabe and Mommy are just catching some sun or chilling in a hallway or something so it's i don't know you, you can make an argument that, that that at minimum they're not they're not exactly villains yeah also i haven't seen them at all in river city girls 2 yet are they there uh they are there in a very oh. small role yeah uh, i was a, i was about to say hey i just kicked them out a window if they disappeared after that that's that's not a very pleasant implication. Yeah, people can <laughs> they can survive window falls as we've seen multiple times at this point. <laughs> uh, the the only thing that I at least wish to say, you know, if there's any misunderstandings when it comes to relationships, again, I, it's better to talk rather than just beat people up. And also, Adam, thank you for joining us on this. 
Yeah, this was so much fun. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we love doing interviews and stuff, but I, this is the first time I've ever done a full game long commentary like this. It was really, it was really awesome to dive, you know, pretty deep on some of these topics with you. Yeah. It means a lot that you're willing to join us for that. Um, it also gives us a lot to talk about because, uh, I mean, we normally find plenty to talk about, but beat us can get a little bit repetitive commentary-wise, so you gave us plenty to talk about, so we definitely appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Brain Scratch commentary is, is often devolves into tangents, the channel, but it, it was nice to spend an entire playthrough actually talking about the game the entire time. We time. had some tangents. Yeah. Well, we, we worked really hard on this, and yeah, we definitely have a lot to talk about, a lot of good stories. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of... This and two are definitely some of my favorite beat em ups now, so oh, thank you. you guys did really good on that. Yeah, hopefully more to come. Oh yeah. Oh definitely. Yeah, I definitely hope for it. I'm I'm looking I'm I'm not only like I'm like a third of the way through River City Girls 2, and I'm already looking forward to River City Girls 3. <laughs> and I also wish to thank Ryan for allowing me to uh not only team up with him on the playthrough, but also for being able to join on this. Yeah, it's no problem at all. I appreciated you coming over and playing with me. Not a pr not a problem. All right, so I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank Adam one last time for joining us, and we'll see you guys for the next playthrough we do. Have a good night. Enjoy.